Welcome to this video on radiographic anatomy of the foot. In this video, we will start by discussing a systematic approach for evaluating radiographs of the foot and then look at the three commonly used views to evaluate the foot by a radiograph. First, when evaluating any radiograph, it is important to orient yourself to the image. Verify the side of the body and use anatomical landmarks to orient yourself to the specific body region. Second, consider the particular radiographic view. In this video, we will discuss the three views most commonly used in radiographic evaluation of the foot, anteroposterior or AP view, AP oblique, and the lateral view. Third, use a consistent approach in evaluating radiographs to minimize failure to notice any clinically relevant findings. Start proximally and continue distally. First, evaluating the cortical surfaces of individual bones, recognizing that areas of bone growth in children may appear as cortical disruptions. Then, proceed to evaluate the relationships between the bones, such as relative bone placement and spacing. Keep in mind that these relationships will differ on weight-bearing and non-weight-bearing views. Of course, always evaluate a radiograph in the context of the patient's history and physical presentation. Let's work through the systematic approach with this radiograph. Typically, a marker will indicate laterality of the image, that is to say if you are looking at a right or a left foot. While we can identify anterior from posterior and medial from lateral, a radiograph simultaneously shows dorsal and plantar structures. Since there is no identifying marker, let's assume this is a radiograph of the left foot and compare it to the reference image of a left foot. This view of the foot that looks at either the dorsal surface or the plantar surface of the foot is called an AP view or an anteroposterior view. Remember that our systematic approach is to evaluate from proximal to distal. Here we will start where we find enough contrast to differentiate the bones of the hind foot from the midfoot. The first bone is going to be the navicular, which plays a structural role in supporting the medial longitudinal arch of the foot. I'm outlining it here now in a maroon color. Now let's find it on the reference image. So again we're looking for the navicular and it's this one right over here. Notice its articulation with the talus on the model so that we know that the talus is within this white region over here. Lateral to the navicular is going to be the cuboid bone which will articulate posteriorly with the calcaneus. So here the cuboid is being highlighted in a magenta color and now in the model and we know that the bone directly behind that will be the calcaneus. So again the cuboid articulates with the calcaneus and the navicular with the talus. The remaining bones of the midfoot are the three cuneiform bones and they lie anterior to the navicular. The AP view shows the medial cuneiform but the intermediate and lateral cuneiforms overlap somewhat in this view and are more easily evaluated on an AP oblique view. The medial cuneiform here is shown in a dark blue while the intermediate and lateral cuneiforms are outlined together in black. The metatarsals, outlined here in yellow, articulate with the tarsal bones posteriorly and the phalanges anteriorly. Notice how the sesamoid bones are aligned under the head of the first metatarsal within the tendon of the flexor hallucis brevis. Each of the metatarsals is numbered 1 to 5. The phalanges are the most distal bones of the foot and are outlined here in an orange color. Notice that the first digit only has a proximal and distal phalanx, while each of the other digits has a proximal, distal, and intermediate phalanx. After evaluating the cortex of each bone, we will turn our attention to spacing, starting here at the most proximal portion of the first and second metatarsal. An increase in space here could indicate a Lis Frank injury. When the Lis Frank ligaments that connect the medial cuneiform to the proximal portion of the second metatarsal become damaged as there is no ligament connecting the most proximal portions of the first and second metatarsals. 
In this radiograph, we can see an increased space between the most proximal part of the first and second metatarsals, indicating compromise to the Lisfranc ligaments. This would be classified as a Lisfranc injury. Now let's consider an AP oblique view of the foot. Again, we have to establish anterior and posterior, medial and lateral. Again, we will assume that we're looking at a left foot. The first bone that can be noticed is the calcaneus, which is the bone that makes up the heel. While we cannot get good visualization of the calcaneus or its structures from an AP view, an AP oblique view or a lateral view will help us to visualize the calcaneus. The other bones of the ankle, such as the fibula, tibia, and the talus, can also be seen in this view. The talus is shown in red on both images. Recall from the AP view that the navicular lies anterior to the talus, and it's shown here in maroon. On the AP oblique view, the lateral cuneiform can be seen in isolation. Remember that this is unique to this view because in the AP view, the medial cuneiform could be seen in isolation, whereas the intermediate and lateral could not be differentiated very well. In the AP oblique view, the medial and intermediate cuneiforms cannot be well differentiated. The last of the tarsal bones to be seen in this AP oblique view is the cuboid. After the tarsal bones, we'll next look to the metatarsals. Again, they are numbered 1 through 5. The AP oblique view is unique in that it shows the tuberosity of the fifth metatarsal and this structure can be thoroughly evaluated for any signs of fracture or other injury. A Jones fracture is a type of fracture that can occur at the tuberosity of the fifth metatarsal, but in children it is important not to confuse a Jones fracture, which will occur transverse to the axis of the metatarsal, with an apophysis, which will occur along the longitudinal axis. Evaluation of the AP oblique view is concluded by evaluating the cortices of each of the phalanges. Remember that some of the highlights from the AP oblique view were that the lateral cuneiform and the tuberosity of the fifth metatarsal are particularly visible in this view. Now let's recall that in our systematic approach of a radiograph of the foot, we will start proximally and proceed distally and begin by looking at the cortical surface of each individual bone. In this radiograph, when we get to the tuberosity of the fifth metatarsal, we see a definite disruption in the cortex of the bone. This disruption is consistent with a Jones fracture in that it is transverse to the plane of the long bone. Since this is an adult patient, a Jones fracture is the most likely diagnosis. If instead this radiograph had a disruption here in the cortex, and was of a child, we might suspect that this is just cartilage that has not yet calcified, and therefore this would not be considered a fracture, but an apophysis. Recall that the muscle insertion of fibularis brevis is at the tuberosity of the fifth metatarsal. For this reason, avulsion fractures are also a possibility at this location. While we have discussed a number of different pathologies using this image, Remember that this is a Jones fracture. The final view of the foot that we will be looking at is the lateral view. Recall that a lateral view will show the lateral and medial surfaces. So when we have established the anterior, posterior, dorsal, and plantar surfaces, then we must recall that there will be structures visible from both lateral and medial surfaces of the foot. Note in the reference images above that you can see structures from both medial and lateral surfaces on the lateral radiograph. First, you see the calcaneus outlined here in green, and recall that it articulates anteriorly with the cuboid bone, which you can only see in the lateral model. Likewise, the talus, shown in red, articulates anteriorly with the navicular, 
which is only seen on the medial view of the model. The cuboid is shown here in pink. It is clear that a lateral view will show the cuneiforms overlaying one another and therefore it will be difficult to view their margins and articulations. Due to the amount of overlap in a lateral view, the metatarsals and phalanges are particularly difficult to evaluate except in relation to one another or the overall shape of the bones. Remember, at the end of your evaluation, you should have considered joint spacing for pathologies such as arthritis.